We're in the second week of our five-week series in discipleship. We are talking about what it is. And we're talking about, am I even, we get tonight, am I even qualified? We're talking about um, what it takes. How, how, do, how do you begin to disciple someone? The cost involved when you step into a discipleship relationship. And then at the very end, we hit week number five. We'll be talking about this for four weeks. Then we cast the ball over to your court. And the question is, what is your next move? We've been talking about it for four weeks. What are you going to do with everything that we've been speaking about? And so last Sunday, we opened up this series with a question of what is a disciple? So a disciple, again, is at its very core, at its very basic definition, a disciple is a learner. But deeper than that, a disciple is someone who dedicates their life to both learning and following the teachings of another person. And so with the calling of the first disciples, we read, the, we read in the Gospels how they left behind one life in order to take on another. And in that life where they chose to follow Jesus. As Christians, our desire should be the same, to leave this old life behind. We accept Christ into our lives and we start this new life where we follow and we dedicate our lives to following Jesus. And then we talked about four basic characteristics that every disciple should have. Now with that, we fully recognize and we promote the, the, that the goal of every believer should be to be like Jesus, right? I want to be like Jesus. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to detour for just a second. I'm going to come back to this thought because we could speak for out, we won't, but we could speak for hours on end every Sunday for over a year. And we would, even if we did that, we would only begin to scratch the surface of the characters of Jesus. It's an attempt to, to try to capture an all-encompassing character because when we do this, we're trying to give definition to the complete character of God. And there's just not enough words, there's just not enough detailed phrases or anything that, that is even close to accurate enough, accurate enough to be able to do this. And so a few months ago, as, as a leadership team, when wanting to come along, wanting to tackle this, this, this seemingly heavy, difficult topic of discipleship, we asked ourselves, what does a wholehearted follower of Jesus look like? And as I, as I said this, um, this very thing last week, it's a reminder, we talked about this, we whittled it down, we talked some more, we whittled it down, and we came up with a handful of characteristics. And we said, man, if, if we could grab onto these four things, as, as a leadership team, if we could grab onto just these four basic characteristics and leave, live them out very well in our own lives, and then in turn, we could help others to grab a hold of these and live them out very well in their own lives. And in turn, they find others and help them to live them out very well in their, their own lives. We will have some absolutely amazing disciples come into life. And this is where we landed last week with the holy acronym. That a disciple of Jesus, he is, a disciple of Jesus is humble. They take ownership of their faith. So that, that is, they... The fruit of their life, how they live their life, is a direct reflection of what they say that they believe. A disciple of Jesus is loving. A disciple of Jesus yearns for God. Now, let me say, let's hold this up here for a second. This, this acronym came about by chance. We, we set out when we did this, we wanted to look at the characteristics of a, of a true, wholehearted follower of Jesus. We weren't out to say, how, how, how can we squeeze this into some easy-to-remember acronym? So, for example, originally when we were looking at, at ownership, the, the first word that we, that we landed on was devoted. And we, we talked about devoted, and we said, well, that doesn't really, doesn't really convey what, what we want to, where, where we want to land. We felt that ownership was a stronger, provided a stronger sense of what we wanted to be able to convey. And so we replaced devoted with ownership. Yearning for God was originally treasuring the written word, but we looked at that and we said, that it just doesn't, it doesn't convey the complete desire for God that we believe that is, is, is necessary. And, and we looked at how Jesus showed up in his relationship with the Father, and we came up with yearn for God. And so we ended up landing with the, the, the holy acronym. That was last week. So this week we're going to talk about am I qualified? Am I qualified to disciple someone? And so with that, here's where we're going to land this afternoon. That while the life of a holy disciple does engage in spending regular time with God in both reading and in prayer, discipling another person in the Christian faith has more really to do with the life that you live and the faith that you have than it does your ability to be able to ramble off Scripture. 
And so we're going to jump right into it. Number one in your outline, if you got it with you, is why me? Why me? Simple answer, Jesus told you to. We could just leave it at that and go home, but I'm going I'm to just take a little bit longer here. So if we look at the 28th chapter of Matthew's gospel, okay, Jesus has resurrected. He's preparing for his ascension into heaven. And we're going we're gonna to jump into this. We're going to start at verse 16. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And I'm going to come back to that phrase there, some doubted, in just a few minutes. Uh, then Jesus came to them and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always until uh, to the very end of the age. And so, for whatever reason, Matthew, Jesus, upon his resurrection, he appears to the disciples multiple times while in Jerusalem. John and uh, Luke both record this. For whatever reason, Matthew chooses to skip over that, and he takes us right to this post-resurrection opportunity where he is in Galilee, and he tells the disciples to go there. And so, he... He records the, that the 11 remaining disciples marched some 40 miles to, to Jerusalem, from, or to Galilee from Jerusalem, just to see Jesus, just to, be, to see him one more time. But more than that, Matthew also records the fact that Jesus told his disciples to go there. And so these, these men had been with Jesus some three, three and a half years, and, and over this time, as his disciples, they learned not to just listen, but they learned to obey the things that he had told them to do. And so they come to the mountain of Galilee, and what does Jesus say to them? He says that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And so therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations and teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. So Jesus, has com he, he's completed his mission here on earth at this point. And he's, prepare, he's preparing now to, to leave, to ascend into heaven, to take his rightful place at the right hand of God. And he says that all authority now sits with him, and he gives them this directive to his disciples to go do what? To go make disciples. Take everything that you've learned from me in both my teaching and my character, and then now teach these things to others. Teach them to obey everything that you have learned from me. Teach them to, to obey everything that I have commanded you. And so they did this. And with the exception of John and, and, and possibly Matthew, it cost every single one of them their lives. That's how important fulfilling this commandment would, from, from Jesus was to them. And it multiplied, right? It multiplied from the original 11 disciples making disciples to other disciples going on to make disciples. And we see this in Ephesians chapter 4. When Paul writes that, he wrote that when you heard about Christ, you were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put, the old, and, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Leave the old life behind, start this new life in Christ, and here is what that looks like. And so now here we are today, as Christ followers, this commission now falls to us. It falls to me. If you are a professing believer in Jesus Christ, then it, guess what? It, it falls to you as well. And again, the answer to the question of why me it, is because Jesus said so. It really, it really is that simple. The only person that has any rights to lordship over our lives has instructed us to do this very thing. So let's go on to number two. Am I qualified? Now, it, it, it's easy to get hung up on this, to, to, to overthink it, to say, man, I, I, if I'm going to disciple someone, then I, I, I've got I've to memorize, I've got to have the Bible memorized, I've got I've to know the answers to any pressing questions that someone may have. I've, I've, got, I've got doubts. I've got to overcome those doubts. And we can begin to unqualify ourselves before we've even answered this question honestly. And so let's, let's begin to address this. And I think the best place to start is to actually look at those who were initially commissioned and to start looking at... So let, let's take a look at the original disciples. 
So keep in mind, with, with the exception of Paul, who came later, these disciples, we, we now refer to them as the apostles, these, these original 11 disciples, they were not scholars, they were not religious leaders, right? They, they were fishermen, they were uh, anti-government activists, there was a, tax, a hated tax collector. Uh, Jesus put together a, a motley crew of sorts, of, of men to follow him, and, and they did. They, they left that life behind. In so many of the accounts, they say they left immediately to follow Jesus. And over the course of just a few years, what happened? Their hearts were transformed, and they carried the character of Christ forward in their own lives for the remainder of their lives. And so when we look at the qualifications of discipling someone, it seems to me that it's both silly and unbiblical to add anything to what has already been established. And so with this, I think when we look at the question, am I qualified, there's definitely some priming questions that we can ask ourselves to help make that determination of, am I qualified? Or maybe, maybe a better way to put it is to ask, am I ready to step into something like this? And so first off, are you a Christian? It seems a bit silly and a little bit obvious, but really, uh, how can you begin to disciple someone in the Christian faith if you yourself are not a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ? And I, I want to point out in verse 17, I want to go back to that verse in 17 of Matthew 28 that we just read, and where, where Matthew records that when they saw him, they worshipped, worshipped him, but some doubted. Matthew says some doubted. He's not referring to the 11, the 11 disciples here. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks about, uh, at some point between the resurrection and the ascension, that Christ had appeared to more than 500 people at one time. And some scholars say that, that, that the, the mountain of Galilee, where Christ told his disciples to come, that that is where that happened. That it wasn't just the 11 disciples that had shown up, but rather it was a pilgrimage of over 500 people that had flocked to Galilee to see Jesus and that some had, had doubted the divinity of Jesus. So the apostles, the original disciples, they knew Jesus died on the cross. They knew he had been resurrected. And all of a sudden, as, 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 as the Gospels tell us, all of a sudden, all the things that Jesus had, had talked about, that I'm going to die and I'm going to be raised on the third day, it all began to make sense. And so they were not, when, when Matthew writes that some doubted, they were not the ones that he was referring to. And so back to the question of, are you a Christian? Because a lot of people identify with, as, as being a Christian without actually really knowing what that means. It's, it's like, well, I, I believe in God, so therefore I must be a Christian. And no, that's, that's not how that works. The real question is not, do you believe in God? The real question is, do you believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ? And to take that a step further, do you believe in Jesus enough to make him Lord of your life? Are you, are you obedient to his teachings? Are you obedient to the things that he has, has asked you to do or is asking you to do? I remember there was uh, recently had a, a meeting with, with John Leland. And I don't remember what we were discussing, but he said something that I'll never forget. He said, you know, believing in Jesus as Savior is easy. It's simple. It's safe. Allowing him to be Lord over your life, though, is something completely different. And so you have to be a believer in Jesus. But what's more, I, I would also say that um, in order to really effectively disciple someone, you, you have to be a disciple yourself. And so then it goes to the question, are you holy? Are you humble? Do you, do, do you take ownership of your faith? Are you walking the things out? Are you walking your faith out in your everyday life? Are you loving? Do you love those around you? Do you love them well? Are you growing? Are you seeking? Are you yearning? For God, do you, do you grow, seek to grow in Him in your relationship with Him every day? Because let's be honest, if you're if you're gonna if you're gonna seek financial advice from someone, are you gonna go hit up the guy that's got a mountain of credit card debt that actually has zero uh, plan to act, to to walk his way out of that debt, or are you gonna go find the person that is sitting financially into the place where you want to be already? Or if you're, you're looking for marriage advice, are you going to talk to the guy that's been married and divorced some 15 times? Or are you going to find the couple that's been, uh, that has a, a, a biblical example of what a, a healthy marriage looks like? And when you look at them, you say, man, that, that's what I want for my marriage. 
And the same goes for our spiritual care and, and, and the discipleship of our lives. If I'm looking for someone to disciple me, I want it to be someone that displays the kind of life, that displays the kind of relationship with Jesus that I want in my own life. It's going to be evident in how they talk and how they, how they live, how they walk out their life. It's, it's going to be evident that how they live is different than what the world already has to offer. I've been in the world. I don't like it. I remember when I first met our founding pastor, Mike Fairburn, back in 2007, we were, we, both of our families were going to Life Center at the time. And so I had seen him around church uh, n- numerous different times, but I never actually officially met him until I walked through the doors of a recovery meeting. And it was immediately evident to me that Jesus was in this man's life. It was because how, how, how he spoke about his faith, it was how he spoke about his best friend and wife, Lisa. It was how he spoke about life in general. He, he, the holy, right? How he just showed up was completely different than anybody else that was in the room. And so I asked for his time. And if Jesus has called me to disciple, then, then, then just like Mike, right, I, I want to live my life in such a way that I am submitted to him and live my life in such a way that there is evidence in my life that, that someone can look at and say, I think, I think Jason maybe has something to offer me. And so a great place for me to start and to intentionally focus on is, is being holy, is, is, is being humble, is owning my faith, walking out my faith loving others and my daily pursuit. I want to grow in my relationship with Jesus every day. How about reading the Bible? Do you know what the Bible says and are you devoted to the teachings of the Bible? I said this last week, but you do not need a degree in biblical studies. You don't need to have attended seminary to be able to study the Bible, to be able to understand the Bible, to effectively be able to disciple somebody. The apostles had what we refer to today as the Old Testament. And they were a direct witness of all that Jesus had said, all that Jesus had done. And for us today, we have the entire Bible. We have the written accounts from the apostles themselves. Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, so that we are fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. The apostles had a relationship with Jesus where they had the the privilege to walk with him in a physical proximity every single day. And it was how they learned, it was how they grew, it was how they grew in their knowledge and how they absorbed the the character of Jesus into their own lives. And so for us, we have his written word. We, 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 we have the opportunity to engage in. We have our physical Bibles. We have fancy, we have smartphones with numerous Bible apps that are out there and commentaries. We have the Holy Spirit. We, even today, we, we have an amazing proximity to Jesus through his written word. And that is how we learn. That is how we grow. And so it would be a very good idea to learn how to study and actually study and read your Bible on, on, a, on a regular basis because the, the Bible is the basis of truth. And with that, we need to also make sure that we abide by the whole truth. I heard a pastor once say that when, when it comes to his teaching, he was asked this question, why, why is it that you avoid certain topics, hard topics? topics that maybe not be popular in culture. And his answer was, well, I just try to stay in my lane. I just want people to feel good about themselves. Well, great. I mean, <laughs> who doesn't? I, I don't like feeling convicted any more than the next guy. I mean, countless times, I, even this week, reading my Bible and just closing it and just saying, Ugh, that hurts. <laughs> But I want to refer back to what Taylor said a few weeks ago in her message when she was talking about wisdom in, 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 our, in our series in James in chapter 3. She said, the wise don't resist conviction. They welcome it. And they welcome it because that is where growth happens. And so we have to be willing to allow conviction to work through our own lives. right? We, we, we have to own our faith. And we also have to be willing to lovingly go there with people. 
when we fail to point out someone's sin in their life, then we fail them. We, we should be more concerned about pointing people back to Jesus, pointing people back to his, his written word, more than we should be concerned that they, they may get upset with us because we, we opted to go there with them. Proverbs 26 says, it says, Do you see a person who is wise in their own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for them. And so we, we need to help people see their blind spots. Don't, don't just tickle the ears with, with niceties. And now, I, I say that, help people see their blind spots. And so it should go without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. Do this with love and a level of tactfulness. This past week, Will, you're going to love this part, okay? I had, I had lunch with Will Haley this past week. And over the course of the conversation, Will chose to go there with me. And he challenged me in some areas of my life that needed some attention. And I didn't like what he had to say. I, I didn't, I didn't, this was on Monday. Sunday, I got done talking about this very thing, about humility, about what humility looks like, what pride looks like. And he made me eat my own words about being humble and introspective. But at the same time, Will also knows that he would have done me a severe in, disservice had he not said anything. And so he had this conversation with me, and there was no question in my mind as, we, as we're having this conversation. He did it in such a way, I still don't like you very much, Will, but he still, he still say, he did, he did this in a way that there was no question in my mind that I knew that he values me and that he loves me. It stung, it hurt, but it was done lovingly and it was done tactfully, and I appreciate it. And as I said last week, part of being a disciple and discipling others, it means that we show up in the same fashion that we, that, that we need others to show up with us. I, I didn't want to hear that hard word in, in, from Will in that moment. But as King Solomon reminds us in, in, in Proverbs 27 that wounds from a friend can be trusted. Wounds from a friend can be trusted. And so part of discipleship is giving people, hear this now, part of discipleship with people is giving them what they need in the moment, which is oftentimes can be very different than what they want. I just wanted chicken parmesan and hang out with my friend for a little bit, but I needed to hear something else. There is never, there is never a point in the Christian faith where we can show up and say, I, I've arrived. There's never a point that we ever have this walk figured out that we do it flawlessly. And so with that, we, we need to remain disciples ourselves. We need to remain learners ourselves. But also understand, when we get into this, to, to carry the, the mantle of someone's spiritual health in the area of discipleship, it's, it's not only a great honor, it's a great privilege, but it's also a great responsibility. If you're going to teach God's word to someone, then it must be taken com completely seriously because you will be held accountable for your influence over that person's spiritual growth and development. And so the last point on our, our outline tonight is, are you committed? I read a blog recently. Um, the author, he said that, that uh, simply sharing your testimony with others is, is discipleship. I'm going to go share my, my testimony about how I met Jesus with this person, and, and hopefully they, they come to know Jesus, and uh, bam, they're discipled, and I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to, I'm going to share my, my, my testimony with this person and, and, and lead them to Jesus, and bam, they're discipled. That's not correct. That's, that's completely wrong on, it, on its face. Now, that is not to say that your testimony doesn't have its place because it, it absolutely does. Your, your testimony and how you came to faith in Christ is important and it needs to be shared. Your testimony is exciting. I've had people, number of people over the years tell me they, they, they would choose either to not share their testimony or shy away from it or just be really reluctant because... Well, my testimony is just, it's not exciting. It's kind of dull. It, it's, not, it's not dramatic. I mean, it's not like I was 
you know, down on Hollywood Boulevard one night, completely blitzed, and I saw this white light, and bam, I was sobered up, and it just, I, I met Jesus right there, and, and it's, it's just not like that. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. My wife came to faith at the age of five, okay? Um, she was in school. Her words, not mine, okay? She was being a pill. And so her teacher takes her out of the classroom, and she says, you know what, I know, I know what you need. And in, and in that moment, five years old, in school, because she was being a difficult child, led her to faith in Jesus. I was working as an RN almost 20 years ago. I did something really stupid. I stuck myself with a dirty needle. Recapped a needle. You never recap a needle. I recapped a needle. Stuck myself with a dirty needle. Scared the jeepers out of me. I ain't found my jeepers yet, but I was... I, I, it, it was in that moment, though, okay, there was nothing exciting about that, but it was in that moment that I had to really look at my, I'm good enough to get to heaven theology. And I had to ask myself, how much faith do you really have in, in what it is that you believe? And it turned out I didn't have much faith in it, and that was how I came to know Jesus. Your testimony is your testimony, church. Your, your, your journey is your journey, and it should, it, should be, it should be shared. Because how about this? Do you realize that when you... When you came to faith that there was a party in heaven, Jesus said in Luke 15 that there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. And so if you coming to faith is not a big enough, is, is, is a big enough deal that, that heaven rejoices, then it's important enough for others to hear about it, no matter how insignificant you think it may be. Because you are not significant. Jesus thought you were important enough to, to, to purchase your soul at the price. You are a prince in the kingdom of heaven. You are a princess in the kingdom of heaven. And at the same time, this is, but we, we need to understand that this, sharing our testimony, it's a form, it, it's not a form, it is evangelism. It is evangelism, and evangelism is super important. But it should not be confused with the work of discipleship. Discipleship takes commitment. And Nathan's going to talk about that. Nathan Brown will talk about this in greater detail here in, in just a couple of weeks when we talk about counting the cost. And so when we, we, we choose to step into this commitment, we need to, to give ourselves an honest assessment about where we're at. Are you in a season? Are you, are, you, are you mentally and spiritually and physically ready? Are you in a place where you can invest in the life of a younger believer? You have to be committed to the process. You can't, you can't half-heartedly disciple someone and expect any sort of real results to come from the fruit of, 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 of your labor. There's going to be seasons, understand this church, there's going to be seasons of waning effectiveness and wisdom at that time may dictate, hey, you know what? Let's hit the pause button on this. I've had to do this recently. I've had to, I had to tell a, a, a friend of mine, I said, brother, you know, the, the current season that I'm in right now, I just, I don't have the margin for, for, for what you need. And I can't commit to giving you the best of what, what I have because you, you deserve to get the best of, of what I have and I, I don't have it and it wouldn't be fair to you. But it's a, it's a season. Andrew and I have, have worked over the years to create margin in our lives to be able to, to do this, to be able to pour into the lives of, of individuals, to be able to pour into the lives of couples. But life being what it is, there, there's just seasons that get the best of us. And there's times where we say, gosh, it's, we've, been, we've been battling for a while. It's Let's come off the battlefield. Let's 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 kind of let's catch our breath. Let's let's just let's get a rest. Let's take a season to just to just be, to allow our soul get, to catch up with our bodies. And if if you find yourself unable to to commit, then I would encourage you to ask yourself: Is the reason that you can't commit because it's a season that you're in? Or are there other commitments in your life that are just not allowing you to be able to do something like this? Have you overcommitted yourself? Seasons are seasons, and a season is just that. A season is temporary. But being overcommitted, being overcommitted can rob us of opportunities that, that, that God puts in front of us. Discipleship is a lifestyle. Discipleship was a lifestyle for the apostles. Discipleship needs to be, must be, a lifestyle for us. And so as we close this out, yeah, we're almost done already. I can't, it's short on purpose because discipleship should not be a long, drawn-out list set of guidelines. Here's what it takes. 
here's what it is. Here's, here's what it takes. Can you do it? Will you do it? Then go do it. It's, it's that simple. I wanted to close out with this. this it's a memo. It's, it's, um, it was written to Jesus, the son of Joseph, who owns the wood crafter carpenter shop in Nazareth. And it is from the Jordan Management Consultants in Jerusalem. And it says, Dear Sir, thank you for submitting the resumes of the 12 men that you have picked for management positions in your new organization. All of them have now taken our battery of tests. We have not only run them, run the results through our computer, uh, but also we have arranged personal interviews with each and every one of them uh, with our psychologist and vocational aptitude consultant. And it's, it is our, the, the staff opinion that most of your nominees are lacking in the background and the education and the vocational aptitude of the type of enterprise that you are undertaking. They do not have the team concept, and we would recommend that you continue your search for persons of experience and managerial ability and proven capability. Simon Peter is emotionally unstable, and he has given in to fits of temper. Andrew has absolutely no qualities of leadership. The two brothers, James and John, the, the sons of Zebedee, they place their personal interest above company loyalty. Thomas demonstrates a questioning attitude that would tend to undermine morale. We feel that it is our duty, this part was my favorite, we feel that it is our duty to tell you that Matthew has been blacklisted from the Greater Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, they definitely have radical leanings, and they both registered high on the score of manic depressive scale. But one of the candidates, however, he shows great potential. He's a, <laughs> he's a, he's a man of ability, and resourcefulness. He meets people well. He has a keen business mind, and he has, high, he has contacts in high places. He is highly motivated. He's ambitious. He's responsible. We recommend Judas Iscariot as your controller and right-hand man. All the other profiles are self-explanatory. We wish you every success in your new ven business venture. It's fun. <laughs> And I, I loved that memo. I just, I laughed when I read that because it doesn't matter who, it doesn't matter who you are. <clears throat> there's no such, I, I believe that there's no such thing as a, uh, a right or wrong personality to be able to step into discipling somebody. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're, you're obedient to Jesus. You allow the Holy Spirit to work in you and to work through you. You can do this. You can disciple someone. And so where I would land with the question, if somebody were to ask me, Jason, do you, do you, think, I'm, you think I'm qualified to disciple somebody? I would say, man, qualify yourself. If, if you can, at the end of the day, if you can look in your mirror and you can, you can look at all these things and you can affirm yourself in these things, then I, then I would say, I think you got your answer. And so then the next question is, well, how? How do I begin to disciple someone? And John Leland, he's going to be up here next week. He's going to, he's going to address this very question. But what if you can't qualify yourself? Well, you look at this and you say, I, I can't do it. Then, then, then I think the question is to ask yourself, where are, you, where are you falling or where are you pulling up short in your relationship with Jesus that, that's keeping you from moving forward as a, as a wholehearted follower of him? Do you know Jesus? I mean, ha have you accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior of your, of your, of your soul? Have you accepted him as your, as your Redeemer? Then if not, I, come, I'm going to be right here. Come talk to me as soon as I'm done. I, I would love to introduce you to Jesus. He, he's waiting for you to meet him. He already knows you. He knew you before you were even born. He already loves you. He already adores you. He's knocking on the door of your heart. And so then the only question to answer is, will you let him in? Do you yourself need to be discipled? I was, I was discussing this very thing with my friend Pete Copeland, Pete Pastors Downriver Church over in the Audubon area. And in the midst of this, I remember how we were talking about this. When we got on this conversation, he said, you know, Jason, the, the, the second most important question that I ever asked someone is, will you disciple me? 
And in case, in case you're wondering, the most important question he ever asked, what do you think it was? He was asking his wife, Becky, to marry him. And I was like, man, that's a good call. I agree with that. Let's pray. I thank you, Lord. I thank you for this group. I thank you, Lord, for, the, for discipleship, Lord. As you have called us, this is what you have, if, if nothing else, you have called us to step into this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then go and teach others the things that you, I have commanded you. Help us to do this well, Lord. We can do this well. Lord, in a, in, a, in a culture, society, a world that just seems to be falling apart literally by the hour all around us. And the divisions that we are seeing. It's really simple. Love you, love others, teach others to do the same. God, infuse us with your Holy Spirit that we may be humble, wholehearted followers of you yearning for you, loving others, owning, Lord, walking out our faith every single day and helping to teach others to do that same thing, Lord, that we may help to make other wholehearted followers of you. What a precious opportunity we have in front of us. Help us to do it well. In Jesus' name, amen.